Hi, this is Brad Constantine, and you've reached the Book of Mormon Lecture Series. I've been teaching seminary and institute for the last 11 years, and uh, this is an attempt to do a deep dive into the Book of Mormon itself. I'm hoping that you'll find this uplifting and edifying. This is not an official recording of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but every attempt has been made to be as doctrinally accurate as possible. So if you're ready for a deep dive into the Book of Mormon, here we go. Hi, and welcome back to the Book of Mormon podcast. This is going to be a discussion of 4th Nephi, Chapter 1. Now, we're going to read the entire book of 4th Nephi today. Oh, there's only one chapter. Um, this is an account of the people of Nephi, according to his record. Now, the righteousness of the Nephites is also a type of the millennial reign. Interesting uh, fun fact, when the Book of Mormon was first published, 3rd Nephi and 4th Nephi were actually one chapter entitled The Book of Nephi. In the 1879 edition, Orson Pratt separated the two books into 3rd and 4th Nephi. Verse 1, and it came to pa- uh, keep in mind that, uh, as, it, as I mentioned, that this is a type of the millennium, uh, but also, um, so as we're reading through this, there might be some things that, the reason that Mormon has included them is because they may happen again in our day. Verse 1, and it came to pass that the 30th and 4th year passed away, and also the 30th and 5th, and behold, the disciples of Jesus had formed a church of Christ in all the lands round about, and as many as did come unto them and did truly repent of their sins were baptized in the name of Jesus, and they did also receive the Holy Ghost. And it came to pass in the 30th and 6th year, it only took two years for all the people to be converted. This rapid conversion will also occur at the, at the beginning of the millennium. Uh, one of the brethren said that they thought that the that it would take about one generation for the entire world to be uh, to be converted at the millennium. If I find that one, I'll read it to you. Regarding missionary activity during the millennium, Elder McConkie said, with the destruction of the wicked and the fall of the great and abominable church, events destined to accompany the ushering in of the millennium, the conversion of men to the truths of the gospel will become easy. In due course, every living soul on earth will come to the knowledge of the truth. This means that when all things shall be made known unto the children of men, they all shall accept the gospel. This will be the day when the great promise to Israel is fulfilled, and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them. Continuing verse uh, 2, Upon all the face of the land, both Nephites and Lamanites, and there were no contentions and disputations among them, and every man did deal justly one with another. Mary G. Romney said, The time will come when the joyful living which prevailed among these Nephites and the people of Enoch will prevail upon the whole face of this earth. It will come when people do as these people did, become converted unto the Lord. Spencer W. Kimball said, as a guide to becoming a Zion society, first we must eliminate the individual tendency to selfishness that snares the soul, shrinks the heart, and darkens the mind. Second, we must cooperate completely and work in harmony one with the other. There must be unanimity in our decisions and unity in our actions. Third, we must lay on the altar of sacrifice whatever is required by the Lord. We begin by offering a broken heart and a contrite spirit. We follow this by giving our best effort in our assigned fields of labor and callings. We learn our duty and execute it fully. Finally, we consecrate our time, talents, and means as called upon by our file leaders and as prompted by the whisperings of the Spirit. Brigham Young said, We need to learn, practice, study, know, and understand how angels live with each other. When this community comes to the point to be perfectly honest and upright, you will never find a poor person. None will lack. All will have sufficient. Every man, woman, and child will have all they need just as soon as they will all become honest. When the majority of the community are dishonest, it makes the the honest portion poor, and the dishonest serve and enrich themselves at their expense. Uh, That's uh, quite an indictment by Brigham Young. Verse 3, And they had all things common, so they lived the law of consecration among them. Therefore, there were not rich and poor, bond and free, but they were all made free and partakers of the heavenly gift. The most striking thing about the law of the celestial kingdom, as it operated among the Nephites and Lamanites and others as well, was the economic equality that prevailed. The scriptures used the phrase, all things common, to describe the condition. This was not a system of communal ownership, such as has been advocated by 19th and 20th century secular political theories, nor did it mean that each person had exactly the same amount of personal goods. As the Lord explained in Latter-day Revelation concerning his divine law of economic equality, you are to be equal, or in other words, you are to have equal claims on the properties for the benefit of managing the concerns of your stewardships, every man according to his wants and his needs, inasmuch as his wants are just. The following instruction may help to fortify, to further clarify the matter. 
the scriptural phrase, they had all things common, is used to characterize those who lived the law of consecration in ancient times. Some have speculated that the term common suggests a type of communalism or Christian communism. This interpretation is in error. The prophet Joseph Smith taught clearly the true nature of having all things common. I preached on the stand about an hour on the second chapter of Acts, designing to show the folly of common stock holding property in common. In Nauvoo, everyone is steward over his own property. Each stewardship is considered private property, and the residues and, and surpluses consecrated for the storehouse became the common property of the whole church. It is referred to as the common property because every covenant member of the of the order had access to it according to his just wants and needs, including the need to improve his stewardship. That was by Andrew Skinner. Marion G. Romney said, Becoming a people which is collectively pure in heart is not an impossible dream or an idealistic goal. When we reach the state of having the pure love of Christ, our desire to serve one another will have grown to the point where we will be living fully the law of consecration. Living the law of consecration exalts the poor and humbles the rich. In the process, both are sanctified. The poor released from the bondage and humiliation or humiliating limitations of poverty are enabled as free men to rise to their full potential, both temporally and spiritually. The rich by consecration and the, and the imparting of their substance or of their surplus for the benefit of the poor, not by constraint, but willingly as an act of free will, evidence that charity for their fellow men uh, characterized by Mormon as the pure love of Christ. This will bring both the giver and receiver to the common ground on which the Spirit of God can meet them. It is the mission of the church of this last dispensation to develop another people who shall live the gospel in its fullness. This people are to become pure in heart, and they shall flourish and be blessed upon the mountains and upon the high places. They shall be the Lord's people. They shall walk with God because they shall be of one heart and one mind and they shall dwell in righteousness, and there shall be no poor among them. There are, there are two cardinal principles, consecration and stewardship. To enter the United Order when it, was, when it was being tried, one consecrated of his possessions to the church by a covenant and a deed which could not be broken. That is, he completely divested himself of all his property by conveying it to the church. Having thus voluntarily divested himself of title to all his property, the consecrator received from the church a stewardship by a like conveyance. This stewardship could be more or less than his original consecration, in, in object, or the object being to make every man equal according to his family, according to his circumstances, and his wants and his needs. This procedure preserved in every man the, the right to private ownership and management of his property. At his own option, he could alienate it or keep and operate it and pass it on to his heirs. The intent was, however, for him not for him to so operate his property as to produce a living for himself and his dependents. So long as he remained in the order, he consecrated the church to the church the surplus he produced above the needs and wants of his family. This surplus went into a storehouse from which stewardships were given to others and from which the needs of the of the poor were supplied. J. Reuben Clark said the fundamental principle of this system was the private ownership of property. Each man owned his portion of, or inheritance or stewardship with an absolute title, which he could alienate or hypothecate or otherwise treat as his own. The church did not own all the property, and the life under the United Order was not a, co a communal life, as the Prophet Joseph himself said. The United Order is an individualistic system, not a communal system. Verse 4, And it came to pass that the thirty and seventh year passed away also, and there still continued to be peace in the land. And there were great and marvelous works wrought by the disciples of Jesus, insomuch that they did heal the sick and raise the dead and cause the lame to walk, and the blind to receive their sight, and the deaf to hear, and all manner of miracles did they work among the children of men. And in nothing did they work miracles, save it were in the name of Jesus. And thus did the thirty and eighth year pass away, and also the thirty and ninth, and the forty and first, and the forty and second, yea, even until forty and nine years had passed away, and also the fifty and first, and the fifty and second, yea, and even until fifty and nine years had passed away. And, and the Lord did prosper them exceedingly in the land, yea, insomuch that they did build cities again, where there had been cities burned. Yea, even that great city Zarahemla did they cause to be built again. But there were many cities which had been sunk, and waters came up in the stead thereof, therefore these cities could not be renewed. 
And now because um, now behold, it came to pass that the people of Nephi did wax strong and did multiply exceedingly fast and became an exceedingly fair and delightsome people. And they were married and given in marriage and were blessed according to the multitude of the promises which the Lord had made unto them. And speaking of marriage, when two Latter-day Saints are united together in marriage, promises are made to them concerning their offspring that reach from eternity to eternity. They are promised that they shall have the power and the right to govern and control and administer salvation and exaltation and glory to their offspring, worlds without end. And what offspring they do not have here, undoubtedly there will be opportunities to have them, th th them hereafter. What else could man wish? A man and a woman in the other life, having celestial bodies free from sickness and disease, glorified and beautified beyond description, standing in the midst of their posterity, governing and controlling them, administering life, exaltation, and glory, worlds without end. And they did not, verse 12, and they did not walk any more after the performances and ordinances of the law of Moses, but they did walk after the commandments which they had received from their Lord and their God, continuing in fasting and prayer and in meeting together oft, both to pray and to hear the word of the Lord. Sounds like they probably had church just like we do. And it came to pass that there was no contention among all the people in all the land, but there were mighty miracles wrought among the people of, or the disciples of Jesus. And it came to pass that the seventy and first year passed away, and also the seventy and second year, yea, and in fine, till the seventy and ninth year had passed away. Naming the years like this must be some Hebrew expression because it seems like it's not necessary, doesn't it? Okay, now we're going to skip from the seventy and ninth year, yea, even an hundred years had passed away. That's better. And the disciples of Jesus, whom he had chosen, had all gone to the paradise of God, save it were the three who should tarry. And there were other disciples ordained in their stead, so vacancies in the quorum of the twelve apostles were filled as needed. And also many of their generation had passed away. And it came to pass that there was no contention in the land because of the love of God, which did dwell in the hearts of the people. A striking feature of Mormon's description of Zion in 4th Nephi is the total lack of contention in the land, which he mentions no less than four times. This surely must have been due to the complete unity of a civilization in which there were neither Nephites, Lamanites, nor any manner of ites, but were all one in Christ, because the love of God dwelt in their hearts. Mormon was something of an expert on contention or civil strife, having read much about it in the records of Alma, Helaman, and Nephi, and having experienced it firsthand during his lifetime. The complete harmony and total unity of the people living in, this, in the society which had witnessed the Savior's visitation surely must have been a stunning development in Mormon's panoramic view of Nephite history. And that was by Andrew Skinner. Wouldn't it have been great to have lived during a time like that when there's so much peace and harmony and stuff? Way cool. 16. And there were no envyings, nor strifes, nor tumults, nor whoredoms, nor lyings, nor murders, nor any manner of lasciviousness. And surely there could not be a happier people among all the people who had been created by the hand of God. Joseph Fielding Smith said, What a glorious time that must have been when everybody was happy, when everybody was at peace, when everyone loved his neighbor as himself. And above all, he loved God, because we are informed here that the thing which brought about this condition of happiness was the fact that the love of God was in the hearts of the people. There never will be a time of peace, happiness, justice, tempered by mercy, when all men will receive that which is their right and privilege to receive until they get in their hearts the love of God. Little Maxwell said, Thus the relevancy of love thy neighbor, if practiced here and now, one day will demonstrate how it will be applied in the coming, there and then, in a neighborhood as wide as the universe. Verse 17, there were no robbers nor murderers, neither were there Lamanites nor any manner of ites, but they were in one, the children of Christ and heirs to the kingdom of God. Anthony Ivans said, we have not succeeded during the past century in accomplishing that which was accomplished by the Nephites, notwithstanding the great results which have come, for, come from our efforts. The people have not yet all been converted to the Lord. We have not reached that condition, which I sincerely believe that we must sometime reach when we are united in temporal things as, as were the Nephites. We have not reached a condition which, where there is no envy, nor strife, nor malice, nor whoredoms, nor any manner of lasciviousness among the people. We have not reached a condition that we are in one, the children of Christ, as the Lord would have us to be. Verse 18, And how blessed were they, for the Lord did bless them in all their doings. Yea, even they were blessed and prospered until an hundred and ten years had passed away, and the first generation from Christ had passed away, and there, were no, there was no contention in all the land. Jeffrey R. Holland said, But then, in the, eight, in the 184th year after Christ's birth, exactly 150 years after his ministry in the New World, 
A small part of the people revolted from the church. That was the beginning of the end of the Nephite society. It took several years to happen and several pages of Book of Mormon history to record it, but those words marked the end of the great Christian epic in the New World of which so many prophets had dreamed and prophesied and for which so many had died. With that phrase, the saga we know as the Book of Mormon began drawing to a close. After 200 years, the movement away from the Zion-like principles of Christ's teaching was inexorable, meaning it, it, it was inevitable, it had to happen. Verse 19, And it came to pass that Nephi, he that kept this last record, and he kept it upon the plates of Nephi, died, and his son Amos kept it in his stead, and he kept it upon the plates of Nephi also. And he kept it eighty and four years, and there was still peace in the land, save it were a small part of the people who had revolted from the church and taken upon them the name of Lamanites. So this is the beginning of the downfall of the Nephites, as Elder Holland just mentioned. Therefore there began to be Lamanites again in the land. A few that were weary of the uninterrupted bliss, the perfect harmony, the universal love that everywhere prevailed, needed or seceded from the church and took upon themselves the title of Lamanite which ill-boding name had only been known to the Nephites in tradition for more than a hundred years. It may be asked, how was it possible that men and women should withdraw from such a holy order or society where all was perfect peace, where every man dealt justly with his neighbors, where, some, where none afflicted wrongs and none suffered from injustice done them, where angels ministered to the children of mortality and heavenly revelations were their constant guides. If the inquirer will ask why Lucifer, the son of the morning in heaven itself, rebelled against the Almighty Father and led astray one third of the, of the angelic hosts, we will reply by saying that he, Satan, tempted the dissenting Nephites with the same spirit of rebellion to the divine power and that he succeeded in ensnaring them and leading them away captive to his will. That was by Reynolds and Schottel. Verse 21, And it came to pass that Amos died also, and it was in 190 and four years from the coming of Christ, and his son Amos kept the record in his stead, and he also kept it upon the plates of Nephi. And it was also written in the book of Nephi, which is this book. And it came to pass that 200 years had passed away, and the second generation had all parted, or had all passed away, save it were a few. And now I, Mormon, would that ye should know that the people had multiplied insomuch that they were spread upon all the face of the land, and that they had become exceedingly rich because of their prosperity in Christ. And now, in this 201st year, there began to be among them those who were lifted up in pride, such as the wearing of costly apparel, and all manner of fine pearls, and of the fine things of the world. Here the insidious nature of pride is laid bare and its destructive effects on Zion are seen in, in an unmistakable way. Pride destroys unity and, pr and promotes selfishness. Pride gets no pleasure out of having something, only out of having more of it than the next man. Pride seeks to create divisions among people purely for the sake of self-interest, that some may place themselves above others and exploit them. As President Benson stated, it was essential the sin of pride that kept us from establishing Zion in the days of the prophet Joseph Smith. It was essentially the sin of pride that did that. It was the same sin of pride that brought consecration to an end among the Nephites. Pride is the great stumbling block of Zion. And from that time forth, they did have their goods and their substance no more common among them. The law of consecration has ended, and they began to be divided into classes. Divisiveness, the opposite of atonement. And they began to build up churches unto themselves to get gain and began to deny the true church of Christ. And it came to pass when 210 years had passed away, there were many churches in the land. Yea, there were many churches which prof professed to know the Christ, and yet they did deny them were parts of his gospel, insomuch that they did receive all manner of wickedness and did administer that which was sacred unto him to whom it had been forbidden because of unworthiness. Don't indulge the wicked with sacred ordinances. This is not mercy. And this church did multiply exceedingly because of iniquity and because of the power of Satan, who did get hold upon their hearts. And again, there was another church which denied the Christ, and they did persecute the true church of Christ because of their humility and their belief in Christ. And they did despise them because of the many miracles which were wrought among them. Therefore, they did exercise power and authority over the disciples of Jesus, who did tarry with them. And they did cast them into prison, but by the power of the word of God, which was in them, the prisons were rent in twain, and they went forth doing mighty miracles among them. So we're talking here about the three Nephites. Nevertheless, and notwithstanding all these miracles, the people did harden their hearts. In other words, miracles don't convert, and did seek to kill them, even as the Jews of Jerusalem sought to kill Jesus, according to, the, according to his word. 
and they did cast them into furnace, furnaces of fire, and they came forth receiving no harm. And they also cast them into dens of wild beasts, and they did play with the wild beasts, even as a child with the lamb. And they did come forth from among them, receiving no harm. The three Nephites are showing a great deal of patience with these people who wanted to kill them. Priesthood holders have always been upon the earth from the days of Adam to the present time. The Lord has never surrendered the earth to Satan. Verse 34, Nevertheless, the people did harden their hearts. What should these people have done when they witnessed the, the miracles? They should have done the same thing their ancestors did in reaction to the miracle of Jesus' visit, the same thing we should do in response to a miracle, repent. But these people did not repent. Instead, they despised the righteous because of the miracles that were wrought among them. The record states that the people did harden their hearts, for they were led by many priests and false prophets to build up many churches and to do all manner of iniquity. Mormon emphasized they did not dwindle in unbelief, but they did willfully rebel against the gospel of Christ. He further states that even the people who were called the people of Nephi began to be proud in their hearts because of their exceeding riches and, because, and become vain like unto their brethren the Lamanites. Thus we can trace the sad count consequences of failure to repent and to stay close to the Lord. The Nephites lost the spirit that had been that had provided them with unity and glorious feelings of charity. That was by Alvin Rencher. Uh, continuing verse 34, for they were led by many priests and false prophets to build up many churches and to do all manner of iniquity, and they did smite upon the people of Jesus, but the people of Jesus did not smite again. And thus they did dwindle in unbelief and wickedness even from year to year even until 230 years had passed away. And now it came to pass in this year, yea, in the 230 and first year, there was a great division among the people. And it came to pass that in this year, there arose a people who were called the Nephites, and they were the true believers in Christ. And among them, there were those who were called by the Lamanites, Jacobites and Josephites and Zoramites. Therefore, the true believers in Christ and the true believers of Christ, among whom were the three disciples of Jesus who should tarry, were called Nephites and Jacobites and Josephites and Zoramites. And it came to pass that they were reject that they who rejected the gospel were called Lamanites and Lemuelites and Ishmaelites. And they did not dwindle in unbelief, but they did willfully rebel against the gospel of Christ, and they did teach their children that they should not believe, even as their fathers from the beginning did dwindle. Thus apostasy, rebellion, wickedness, and great abominations of every manner and form overran the Nephite people and became part of their worship. Satan, in other words, was setting up his church again among them, and he did the same thing in manner and form in the old world when the descendants of the saints of Jesus' day began to depart from the re revealed moorings. With apostasy comes war and destruction, and so, continuing the divine chronology, Nephi was shown the destruction of the people who bore his name, and the dwindling in unbelief of his Lamanite kin until they became a filthy people, full of idleness and all manner of abominations. That was by Millet McConkey. Verse 39, and it was because of the wickedness and abominations of their fathers, past generations do have an influence over the present generation, even as it was in the beginning, and they were taught to hate the children of God, even as the Lamanites were taught to hate the children of Nephi from the beginning. And it came to pass that 204 and 40 and 4 years had passed away, and thus were the affairs of the people. And the, war, and the more wicked part of the people did wax strong and became exceedingly more numerous than were the people of God. Um, and from Mosiah, he says, And if the time comes that the voice of the people doth choose iniquity, then is the time that the judgments of God will come upon you. Yea, then is the time he will visit you with great destruction, even as he has hitherto visited this land. Verse 41. And they did still continue to build up churches unto themselves and adorn them with all manner of precious things. And thus did 250 years pass away and also 260 years. And it came to pass that the wicked part of the people began again to build up the secret oaths and combinations of Gadianton. Here we go. Without question, Satan was at the very heart of the secret combinations which destroyed once and for all, without hope of recovery, the Zion society of the Nephites. He alone inspires the hearts of wicked men to secretly combine against righteousness, and he, con and he concocts and administers the oaths of and covenants of his kingdom. However, Satan could not have made any inroads without the initial overture of the people themselves. Joseph Smith taught that the moment we revolt at anything which comes from God, the devil takes power. The people of 4th Nephi, guilty of this revolt or rebellion, consciously rejected light and truth. 
And that was by Andrew Skinner. Verse 43, And also the people who were called the people of Nephi began to be proud in their hearts because of their exceeding riches and become vain like unto their brethren, the Lamanites. Pride begins to enter the church. And from this time, the disciples began to sorrow for the sins of the world. And it came to pass that when 300 years had passed away, both the people of Nephi and the Lamanites had become exceedingly wicked, one like unto the other. And it came to pass in that the robbers of Gadianton did spread over all the face of the land, and there were none that were righteous, save it were the disciples of Jesus. Hugh Nibley said, From the first, according to the apocalyptic concept of history, men have chosen the darkness rather than the light. This teaching receives great emphasis in the Book of Mormon, where a constantly recurring event is the apostasy of God's church from the way of righteousness. Such general apostasies are described in Alma, Helaman, 3rd Nephi, and 4th Nephi. Behind this is the general weakness of the human race and the nothingness of the children of men, which make this world inevitably the kingdom of darkness and the dominion of Satan, which comes by the cunning plans which he hath devised to ensnare the hearts of men. And gold and silver did they lay up in store in abundance, and did traffic in all manner of traffic. Again, Hugh Nibley, such an economic order in which everyone was busy trafficking and getting rich was not, according to 4th Nephi, a free society. It was only under the old system, he tells us, that they had all things common among them. Therefore, they were not rich and poor, bond and free, but they were all made free and partakers of the heavenly gift. So now, even though they're trafficking, they, they don't have everything in common or they're not, uh, they're not equal. Verse 47, And it came to pass that after 305 years had passed away, and the people did still remain in wickedness, Amos died, and his brother Amaron did keep the record in his stead. And it came to pass that when 320 years had passed away, Amaron, being constrained by the Holy Ghost, did hide up the records which were sacred, yea, even all the sacred records which had been handed down from generation to generation, which were sacred, even until the 320th year from the coming of Christ. And he did hide them up unto the Lord, that they might come again unto the remnant of the house of Jacob, according to the prophecies and the promises of the Lord, and thus in the end of the record, and thus is the end of the record of Amaron. Not everyone was wicked. There were still some who kept the commandments. And uh, remember that Mormon is going to show up here. So Mormon's family, I'm sure, were righteous. So even though it mentions that everybody's wicked, it's not uh, entirely the case. There are still some righteous people, uh, but predominantly they're wicked in general. I bear testimony that these things are true and that this is a an indication of what it might be like prior to the second coming that there will be or that after the second coming that there will be great uh, righteousness that the law of consecration will be lived during the millennium and there will be great peace like like we're seeing here in fourth nephi unfortunately it didn't last for them but it will for us i bear testimony to this in the name of jesus christ amen